This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I began podcasting last year because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice, as I like to say, not only reaching out to people who might already be in therapy or be interested in psychology, but might never darken the door of a therapist, but are just curious enough to know what someone like me might have to say about things. So that's Self Work. We're actually going to be talking about four very common hurdles in couples counseling, things that I think people really have odd ideas about or just plain misunderstandings about the therapeutic process. So I thought it'd be helpful to talk about it. There are also hurdles for individual counseling, or at least a couple of them are, but I think it helps to talk about it in a couple's context. I want to say that today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com, and I'll have an offer from them and from me coming in a few minutes. But first, I want to thank those of you who took time this week to give me a rating or review on iTunes. I looked, and I was so dismayed because somebody gave me a one star, and I thought, which means I hate it. I thought, okay, well, I'm getting my first negative feedback. And actually, the review was quite lovely. So I think she just, or he just got it confused about the stars. (laughs) But anyway, thank you to One Bible Study Girl and Jay Dizzle 219 for leaving me such nice reviews. I hate to really care about all that kind of stuff, but the numbers do make a difference as far as other people finding self-work. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So again today, we're going to be talking about What keeps people from going to couples therapy? Some of the gains that I've heard couples say they make is, I never knew how to listen. I was always thinking about the next thing I was going to say. Or, I was trying to show him I loved him, but not in a way he wanted to feel loved. So you can learn skills and behaviors, make connections with your own childhood and what's going on in your relationship. And you can end really growing together and not apart. So today's topic is couples counseling. The email from a listener today is how to support a friend when their child decides to be estranged from them. Kind of a complex topic, really. So thanks for being here today, and let's get started. There are nine words that are music to a marital therapist's ears. We came in before there was a real problem. (laughs) I love it. My heart jumps. This very wise couple didn't wait until a crisis had hit. No one is flirting with a co-worker. There haven't been vicious, repetitive arguments late at night, or perhaps even worse, really steely silence, where the only words spoken have been about the details of their kids' lives. But that's not the norm. Many couples don't do maintenance on their relationship. Instead, they're so inundated with normal distractions, trying to get a promotion, piles of laundry, figuring out how to make the car run one more year, helping with math, homework, the list can go on and on. And the erosion of their relationship, if they still have a sense of relationship, can take a back seat. Very problematic patterns may begin to entrench themselves as when heavy rains run down a hill and create deep gashes in the soil. When it rains again, the water will travel exactly where the gashes have worn themselves into the dirt. Behavior and communication between two people is the same. When there's a storm, when there's conflict or disappointment, both people can find themselves saying and doing exactly what they said and did before, not even recognizing what is propelling them forward. They'll say things like, I don't know why I can't stop myself, but I say the same hurtful things I've said before and then some. Or I also hear, I know if I walk away, she'll get mad, but I do it anyway. I don't know what else to do. If this sounds familiar, (laughs) this podcast may be exactly what you need to listen to. So obviously this is a problem. 
when trust is damaged, when you're not sure you even like your partner anymore, when words have been spoken that are difficult to forget, it can feel like it's too late. You can give yourself permission out of hurt or anger to turn away emotionally, and then detachment begins. And you even imagine a fresh start, a new relationship, before you've even attempted to fix what's wrong with the one you're in. So what's going on with that couple that comes in before those patterns begin their ominous control? What are they doing that's different? First, they're likely two people who take their own fair share of the responsibility for the patterns they've created. And perhaps they realize they just might be able to stop the pattern before it begins. Second, they're doing maintenance, prevention, What's that saying? Prevention is worth a pound of cure. However, so much of the time, couples aren't proactive. Their relationship is nearly in ruins before they seek help. So what's the rationale that's getting in their way of considering therapy, maybe getting in your way of considering therapy? These are four that I hear a lot out in the community. And sometimes I'm even hearing in my office as people begin to say, You know, I really enjoyed this session. I was afraid it would be X, Y, or Z, and it wasn't. So I'm going to call them misconceptions, okay? The first misconception is that therapy involves giving up control. What's underneath this misconception? A problem with control. What does someone like this say? Some stranger isn't going to tell me what to do. So there's a huge misperception out there that therapy is somehow like school and the therapist is the teacher. She or he has all the answers and you, the student, are assigned tasks which are your responsibility to perform. The assumption that the therapist has this kind of authority can set up understandable defensiveness, even rebellion, before therapy has even begun. This is particularly difficult in couples' work. Because your partner is present when suggestions are being made. They can tattletale to the therapist, or worse yet, taunt you with what you're supposed to be doing. I've had that happen so often. How many times have I heard, I told her that you said she should be talking to me before she makes a decision about the kids, but she didn't do that. What a good therapist does have is objectivity and experience. They act as a consultant would. Seeing the problems you're describing in the context of the hundreds of stories they've heard. They may connect present day issues with your past or notice behavior or communication patterns that are harder for you to see, but it's the same as a coach watching your golf swing or a chef testing food you prepared in a cooking class. They have their insight to offer into your choices. Therapists consult, they don't rule. And when suggestions are made, maybe homework is given, your partner can't be the change police. Those things need to be discussed in the session. And what I tell people all the time is, one of the hardest things about couples work is keeping the focus on your own change, not on the change of your partner. That's what you've got control of, and that's what you need to focus on. Misconception number two are excuses of money, time, and availability. Misconception being it's too expensive, it's going to take too long, and you can't find a good therapist. And underneath that issue, I believe, is a problem with vulnerability. These are very common excuses. Like I said, it costs too much, it takes too much time, and you can't find a therapist when you need one. But these excuses have answers. Many therapists will work with you on the financial aspect of receiving their services, Yes, their time has a tangible cost, but so does divorce. There are brief therapy counselors and solution-oriented counselors, and the very fact that couples therapists take new patients mean that some of their patients are working hard and making positive changes, so they have room to see you. Therapy does not have to be a long, drawn-out experience. You might want to ask your therapist if they use that kind of model, That's a very appropriate question to ask. You know, my father-in-law used to joke, people pay to talk to you? (laughs) And in many ways, his teasing revealed an important point. There's a misconception that therapy is all about talk, words. It's not. Therapy is about a specific kind of relationship. There's a focus on you and what you want to change in your life. 
Your therapist's job is to carefully understand and hold your emotions, your hurt, your anger, and help you work through them. She or he is emotionally present with you, helping you to maneuver through whatever is causing pain. For couples, the work for a therapist becomes to provide that compassion and support to both, even though there can be vast disagreement and conflict. Therapy can make you feel very vulnerable, and it's that fear or discomfort with vulnerability that can fuel a defense. In my opinion, it costs ultimately more to ignore the problem and refuse to consider help. As I said, divorce is very expensive, not only financially, but emotionally. Now, before we get to the last two hurdles or misconceptions, let's talk a little bit about the offer from Audible.com. Today, you can enjoy a month-long free trial from Audible and get one free book if you go to audibletrial.com slash self-work. That's audibletrial.com slash self-work. I'll have that link in the show notes. Now, I'm suggesting the book, The Five Love Languages, which if you read, you may never need couples work, but you can choose any book you like. The Five Love Languages is a book about learning how to understand and show love to your partner the way they can receive it, which is not necessarily the way you do show it. Now, if you're wondering about what I'm going to do with the proceeds, because I do get paid if you do this, I will donate all proceeds to St. Jude's Children's Hospital, which is a phenomenal facility treating children with cancer for free. So it's a win for you and a win for St. Jude's. Check out audibletrial.com slash self-work and pick out the book you like and a free trial for a month. Now, we're going to get back to the misconceptions. Misconception number three. There are questions about privacy and anonymity. And I believe underneath this issue is shame. What you hear, I don't want anyone to know our business. You know, there's really no getting around this one. At its root is a struggle with shame. If you're $50,000 in debt, if you've got an addiction, if you were abused as a child, if you meticulously clean your house at 3 o'clock in the morning, these things are important for a therapist to know or they can't help. Yet they are all very difficult to reveal. Your partner knows and maybe even has kept the secret with you. The two of you can act to keep those secrets or decide they're killing your relationship. Facing shame can be hard. I know I've done it. Recognizing trauma for what it is, respecting and understanding our genetic inheritance, and letting go of shame is a huge part of therapeutic work. And again, you're confronting your own shame with your partner watching. That can be hard, especially if it's a behavior past or present that they didn't know anything about. A good couples therapist will try to ensure that when you're revealing something, your partner learn how to listen to that with compassion and without judgment, because it takes courage to reveal. So the final misconception, there's no way someone can understand both sides. Okay, what's underneath that one? I think trust. In couples work, both of you are saying your side of the story, and then the therapist is listening, watching, asking questions. It's very different from individual work where obviously the therapist is only hearing your perspective. Now, I tell people all the time that I don't want to vilify their partner unless there's truly significant or severe abuse, and then, of course, we're going to call a spade a spade, but it doesn't help the person sitting in front of me to blame their partner for what are the problems in the relationship. I want to understand the role of both people, whether I've got both people in the room or not. So a therapist listening to two sides of the issue may or may not agree with either one of you. But with a good therapist, and by the way, episode one, my very, very, very first episode is about how to choose a good therapist. But with a good therapist, you'll feel that both sides are considered, not necessarily always 50-50, because the therapist may feel one of you is not being rational. Good therapist Don't have the agenda of figuring out, however, who's right and who's wrong. The point is you're communicating respectively about your perspectives and about your differences. 
The interesting thing about couples work is that you're watching the therapist interact and try to listen to and understand your partner with compassion, with empathy. You can watch how your partner responds to being treated that way. And you can hear your partner digging deep. You can begin to respect and understand the opposite view. That can be truly life-altering for the relationship because you can begin to understand what it must feel like to be the other person. And isn't that what empathy is? So to recap, the first misconception is that therapy involves giving up control. No. A good therapist is a consultant. The second misconception is really a problem with vulnerability because they'll say therapy costs too much, it takes too much time, and you can't find a therapist. Those are really all excuses. There are plenty of therapists who, by the way, work in free health clinics, so you can find one there if money is truly a huge problem. Misconception number three, there are questions about privacy and anonymity because you can believe that therapists are going to tell people what you say or you don't want to reveal all of your life. I assure you, therapists will lose their license if they're not confidential. And the fourth misconception is there's no way anyone can understand both sides. No, that's a product of you not understanding your partner's side. It doesn't mean that a therapist can't understand both sides. So if your relationship is struggling, try to find a therapist that has a lot of experience with working with couples. It's a whole different ball game, And so you want to make sure that your therapist has that experience. Email from the listener today is about a kind of a sticky subject. He gives me his name. He says, I subscribed to Self Work last summer and I appreciate the insights in your podcasts. I'm trying to think of ways to help a good friend. I could tell he was shaken by a letter from his youngest son, and I heard him recounting episodes of obstinate behavior when his son was younger and times when he needed to exercise his parental authority. He did say he visited a therapist after receiving the letter from his son. What it said in the letter was that the son was ending his relationship with his father due to his father's behavior, and he gave a very different perspective than my friend. My friend may not be perfect, no one is, but he's the type of person you would want in your foxhole when times are tough. He is neither a hothead or a screamer and has worked hard to provide for his family. This may be beyond the scope of what your practice can do from a distance. Please let me know your thoughts. And at first I kind of thought that. I thought, uh, this is way too much information. Actually, I'm leaving out a large part of what he sent to me because it's got too many details in it that would be identifying but I write him back. Thank you so much for being a subscriber. You're right that it's hard to distinguish what my take or perspective might be in this situation. It would be nice to hear what kind of responsibility your friend is taking for things having deteriorated to this point. If I had both your friend and his son in the room, the dynamics usually can be seen fairly clearly, although it could take some time, especially if someone, either one, is proficient at lying. The son's letter is certainly full of anguish and anger over many things. And if your friend is shaken, as you say, then perhaps the son is blowing his behavior out of proportion, distorting things, or still has hurt about what was a divorce. But just as possible, your friend is someone who publicly has one persona and privately has another. I know that must be hard for you to consider, but that does occur. I definitely recommend that your friend find a good therapist and try to come up with a plan to address what his son is quite vehemently asking for. Maybe other family members could join them in family therapy or both of them set something up. He seems to want your friend to consider that his actions have had a painful impact, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So it's a hard situation. I would usually recommend, however, that your friend trying to view it not as a threat, but as a very painful boundary his child is setting. I hope that's helpful, and you're a good friend for caring. 
you know, of course, we always or many of us will take a friend's side in something because we love them and we care about them. And yet sometimes it may be important to remember that what goes on behind closed doors is really never known. So believe in your friends, of course, but when they get feedback from other people that something really bad or hurtful has happened, it probably doesn't help to take sides. It's just better to listen and support them in whatever pain they may be in. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks so much for listening today to Self Work. You can reach out to me by emailing me, which many of you are doing. I love it because I get to know who you are. <laughs> My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. And I will try to get back with you as soon as possible. As mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, I so appreciate getting ratings and reviews on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher. Thank you for that feedback. And that support. It's very, very motivating. And of course, the subscriptions are also out of this world. You can subscribe either to my website, which is drmargaretrutherford.com, and sign up for my newsletter, which would include a weekly blog post and a weekly podcast. Or you can subscribe wherever you listen, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever. So thank you so much for listening. If your relationship is in trouble, I certainly hope that you will consider couples counseling. It can truly turn your relationship around if both of you work really hard. Take good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.